Welcome back. You're listening to the Purple Worm. And I think just before we start, I think I hear the sound of a random table being rolled up. That must mean Dave Aldridge is near. Hi listeners, Dave here. In this episode, you will hear me disparage Frost's pronunciation of the word Rulia when he regularly addresses the excellent website Reviews from Rulia on his show Hump Day Bloggerama. I have subsequently learned to read <laughs> and therefore would like to retract those comments and apologise to Froth and of course recommend that you listen to Hump Day Bloggerama because it is an excellent service both to RPG blogging and to the uh, community at large. I'm sorry Froth. <laughs> And before we get started, we've got a few voicemails from the one, the only, Shandy Andy. And Dave's going to take up the mantle of answering those. So take it away, Andy. Hey up guys, Shandy Andy here. Cracking episode on the Black Hack, really enjoyed it. Some great things coming out of the discussion you guys were having and I can only echo really what you've been saying. It's uh, right up there for me, one of my favourite games. Um, really pushing BX or Old School Essentials to be my go-to system I think at the moment. Uh, the only query I've got, I don't know whether it'll stand the test of time because I've had a lot of games that have done that in the past but BX has always come out on top but I think Black Hack's probably the best of the rest at the moment and maybe, maybe it'll take over I've only played a couple of games of it so far and only actually had the box set for a few days but a couple of quibbles I will mention I don't think the index stroke appendix at the back is quite good enough I know it's only a small book but uh, there's things like um, where it says attack damage at the back there. It says go to page 10. You go to page 10 and it just tells you a little bit about uh, attack damage. It doesn't actually tell you what it is. You have to go into the character class for that. And it's not obvious. And it took me a while to figure that out, to be honest. Um, but it's only a little nigg niggle. The other thing I'd say with usage die, I'm actually think that uh, one of you mentioned about oh it'd be not, you know great if a bit like Legolas run out of arrows in the middle of battle and I think that would be good currently you can't do that because you do the usage die at the end of combat so I'm kind of thinking maybe it, the role is done at the end but it's not going to apply until the end of the next combat or the role's done at the beginning of the combat with a chance that if it's a 1 or 2 on a d4, it actually will occur during the combat, potentially, or if it hasn't at the end. The sort of mechanism I'm thinking about was uh, if you roll, say, a 20 or something on a d6 for your uh, missile attack, that would indicate if you were currently on a chance of it running out, then it would run out. don't know, need to have a think about that, but I would like to have a chance of a torch going out in the middle of the battle as well i think that'd be quite nice um but yeah it's a great get it's a great system a lot of uh, really good ideas in there hey andy yeah in response to i think it was me who suggested that moment where legolas realizes he's out of arrows or he's down to his last couple and he sticks them in the ground and he has to make them count i did actually um think about that a bit more and i called into joe richter's show to suggest an optional rule um, so I thought rather than relying on the roll of the die, although I accept, you know, if you're on D4 for usage and you roll a, um, a 20, then absolutely you should run out at that point. You should reach into your quiver and realize that you've got no more arrows. That's a great idea. Um, but I suggested also, why not put that in the player's hands? So why not let the player declare that this is their last arrow? And then they can really make it count. So if they choose to declare that this is their last arrow, maybe it can automatically hit and do double damage. That sounds like a big thing to give away until you remember that the uh, the thief has a version of that ability anyway. 
Um, so that was my thought on that one. Yes, you're right that rules as written, the black hack doesn't allow for that. But that was my suggestion for how you could um, develop a rule that would let the player declare that and have it count. And, and that, that would be at cost because for, um, for the duration of that session, they would have no more ammunition. In response to your criticism of the index, absolutely. Even though the rules are only on that sort of 30 pages, I find myself flicking around for the particular table I want. I do also own the PDF um, and I use that with my tablet. Um, I use that for a lot of the games that I run, which means I can just type the word I want into the search bar. But um, yeah, you'd think with the black hack being so light in terms of the actual rules that you'd use that option a lot less but i still find myself um needing to default to that i agree the index isn't very good and it, it would seem you should be able to find things easier than you can as for the black hack versus ose yeah next year the games i intend to be running will be the black hack and old school essentials i've bought into old school essentials because um i want to i want to i want to experience that authentic old school experience i want to run it i want to try and write modules for it i'm thinking you know i've got aspirations to put out content and i'm thinking there would be demand for that kind of stuff but i suspect that um just for speed and ease that the black hack will come out on top for me. Uh, I really want to fall in love with old school essentials. I think the books are beautifully presented, but I just kind of think, you know, Black, Black Hack's already got a head of steam for me. I'm loving the sessions. People seem to be enjoying it. I'm finding it really easy to run. So I think that old school essentials is going to find that hard to beat. Uh, and I'm I'm not sure making the old school experience more authentic is going to improve my enjoyment um, but we will both have that to discuss as uh, the year goes on no doubt cheers very much for calling andy okay so let's crack on with the main episode we have a few last thoughts on christmas gifts as we were discussing in our christmas eve bonus episode and then we move on to talk about a topic that is quite the rage in the audio dungeon at the moment and that's the black hack so without further ado spencer what are your final thoughts on christmas gifts i only i only wanted to add that when i mentioned what uh, ben milton was doing the um May's nights and I suggested that it was like Troika. It's obviously well it's also just like um what Enter the Odd is doing. Yeah, I, I was gonna say that. Of, <laughs> I was gonna say it kind of comes from Warhammer, in fact. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what yeah, which mm. Colin pointed out in the last yeah, yeah, that's Warhammer done that first. Yeah. So next we're moving on to a subject that I think uh, I think Dave might uh, know a little bit about and that's the black hack so obviously that's potentially another quite influential uk design that's been hacked ironically enough a number of different times so does anyone want to kick off with a bit of a discussion about the black hack i mean i'll explain what it is i don't know anything about the background i don't know anything i mean i had the pdf of first edition at some point and that's why i backed the second edition but i will give you the i'll, I'll give you the quick breakdown yeah so the black hack is um a roll under system um it's uh it's a uh, pete used the term the other day i absolutely swear by the term it's an indie osr game um so it's trying to recapture an idea of what those old games were like, but it's not really because it doesn't use the same mechanics, right? It uses the same six core stats, um, but you have a roll under stat system that works for skill rolls. It works for saves. It works for combat. Um, it has the wonderfully innovative mechanic of the usage die, which I'm sure we'll talk more about. Um, and then the other thing is that all of the rules of the black hack, you can pretty much sum up on a, well, you can sum up the core mechanic on a page and you could 
you could play it. But all of the rules are pretty much 30 pages. Um, and then if you're looking in the Black Hack book, everything else is um, wonderful for generators, uh, random tables. It really does embrace that kind of, you know, this this is a rule set. You can pick it up. You can plan it really quickly. It's just got four classes. Doesn't make much of an effort about races. You can do races, um, but they're all absorbed into the background mechanic. And the, the, what the background is, is a nice flavorful one line description of your character's background, which you can use to uh, get advantage. It uses that fifth edition advantage mechanic to get advantage once per session. On the, the sort of intro page, it describes itself as a comprehensive, rules light, old school fantasy role playing game, obviously developed by David Black. And the subtitle is featuring a DIY homebrew of original era fantasy gaming by which they mean D&D, and modern game design theory. Um, the cover art's by Carl Sternberg, interior art by the same person, David Black, Sean Pop, and Jeff Cole, and it's been edited by Pookie, who seems to edit pretty much every other UK-based <laughs> RPG that is going, and does his own uh, blog that I, I forget the name of in the minute, um, Reviews from Ryla. Ryla. That's it, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. Or however you pronounce that Cthulhu Mythos word. Indeed. We should have asked him, Dave. We should have asked him that. Mm. And just to just to point Froth out... Froth says real yay, but that's too many consonants. It definitely hasn't got that many consonants. And since we've been talking about layout, this is a digest size book, twin column. Uh, there's some nice pieces of artwork inside it. It's all laid out very clearly. There's a lot of tables. It's black and white. A lot of the art is sort of like small, sort of little pieces of art that are just used to, to break up the text. There's no like massive sort of like mad pages of like artwork. But it's what there is is very tasteful. In no, there. but but also you haven't got you haven't got any scenes in the art, have you? Ap no. Apart from the um, the art that attaches to the character classes, it's all just kind of objects and accoutrements. Mm. There are no big kind of epic scenes or 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 setting. It's took the setting no. out of the art, and mm. yeah, 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 yeah. And if we if we look in there as Dave was saying there's the standard six attributes that you're familiar with from D&D. &D. There are four classes, warrior, thief, cleric, and wizard. You determine, there's lots of familiar stuff that you'll find in here, you know, hit points, levels, etc. Although some of them do have like a, their own little spin on them. There's also a, a character background that you get to pick, which is just, there's a, a D12 table of inspirations for these, so if I just yeah, but you can you can do what you like. Yeah, yeah of course yeah. you can. You can do your own. But let's say I'm just going to roll a, a d12 here. Let's take a bit of a tip off, Dave. And... We're rolling on the random tables. I say roll a d12. So what did I get? I got a four. So on the table that says my reputation was ruined by vices. Now that's that's nice and vague. You can it gives you a bit of guideline as the table says. It's inspiration, and. What you can do with your background is it says background should ideally contain one piece of world building fiction, allowing the player to create a narrative tied to the game world or an element unique to their character. It should also reveal a specific skill or narrow field of proficiency. Now, I believe, and I'm sure Dave, you'll correct me on this because you're far more conversant with the Black Hack rules. I believe you can use your background once per session to give you That's some right. sort of bonus. Is it, it gives you an advantage on a roll, is that correct? That's right. You can use it for advantage. When I'm running, I, I say normally advantage is advantage on the roll that you're doing. But I'm slightly more generous with it because I kind of think your background should indicate those areas where you'd rather not whiff. Yeah. yeah? So mm. I so I tend to use it to grant a re-roll. So if you roll and, and then you can justify that your background would mean that you should be good at this, then I'll give a re-roll. It's basically the same as advantage, but I'm a little bit looser about when you can declare it. So I will actually let you declare it 
after the roll. If you say, my background says I shouldn't whiff on this, then you can have another roll. It's basically the same as advantage. Yeah. yeah. Now, if we, in terms of the simplicity of the, the character sheets, as Dave was saying, the sort of rules being fairly sort of condensed, each of the character sheets in here for the different classes, it fits on a single digest size page, and that includes like quite a big sort of graphic. So like the warrior, you've got like a big guy with like a horned helmet on it, but everything you need for your character sheet is on there. And on the facing page, all of the special rules for that particular clash, you know, how you determine your hit points, uh, a random item that you'll start with. So the, the warrior starts with a war trophy, which you can roll up on a D6 table. And that covers things like the scalp of an enemy chieftain, ears from a goblin tribe, or a dragon tooth pendant, to give a few examples. There's a couple of sort of lists of like equipment and you just pick one of those and that's your starting equipment. Then you get a few special rules. So the the warrior, they're good at repairing their armor. They also have something called a shield bash, where if they get certain rolls when they're defending, they can inflict damage on the enemies that like botch them in the face with the shield. They also get uh, what's called a dealer of death, which means they can do additional attacks at higher level against certain enemies. And then there's a a little section which says when you gain a new level in the system this is what you do so if the warrior you roll a d20 once for each attribute if you roll over that attribute goes up by a point uh, you can also make an extra roll for one attribute of your choice you gain one hit dice so you roll a d8 with advantage to gain that many additional hit points and you gain an additional damage dice for the purpose of doing your dealer of death special skills and all the various classes have their own sort of special but that, skills but that's it what you just read that's the whole lot that's everything yeah. about the warrior ever that's all the rules yep um so could, on the thread goblin's henchman said what about the carousing rules and i've heard him call in on various shows about the carousing rules yeah he's referring yeah. to the experience system and the leveling up system i wonder if someone wants to talk about that because i think that's a really distinctive and lovely feature of the black hack i don't know if colin you'd like to talk yeah about i'll that. talk about that because um mr henchman or if it's okay i'll call you goblin um <laughs> or goblins oh, i just call, just call him biggie g <laughs> <laughs> He, he, he asked me this question. He asked me this question in the call-in, and I answered everything but that. But right. it was part of it was part yeah. of a quite. It was a, a, a comprehensive call-in, and um, I, I went back. I went back on the on the question, referring to some other black black hack stuff, and then I just couldn't go back and another again. Again, I thought, oh no, you know, I I put. I did the episode and realized I hadn't answered this. So the carousing uh, and the leveling up, it, it is one of them things you read it, you think, oh, yeah, oh, that's pretty cool. I wonder how that will work out. I don't know. And in in the play of it, I don't know if it's just the players we've got or or what. It's, it's just been brilliant because what you do is there are kind of like – it's like a um, – you get experience for achievements, big, biggish kind of things. There, there are ideas in the book, such as defeat a major villain or succeed in a mission. Or there's a, a small handful. I mean, it's, and it's so non-granular. Yeah, it's so non-granular yeah. as to be basically milestone, isn't it? It's yeah, basically. basically I was going to say, if, if I can just jump in, because I, I did have a question that I was planning to ask Dave. So between running uh, sessions of the Black Hack, but I think this is a good opportunity to ask it now. Um, the the gaining a new level says acquire and share a number of experiences equal to your current hit dice mm. to advance a level, and your current hit dice will be equal to your level anyway. So if you're level two, you need to share two experiences to go up to level three. Now, one thing I, I didn't quite get from reading it is that sort of you need to share an experience from each game session or let's say you've like defeated two different enemies in right. one session could you share that, that that's too i'll, ba I'll bounce this, yeah i'll bounce this back to colin in a minute the way i've been defining it is that i i'm giving away 
to the players' experiences, and you can basically think of them as one point. And at the moment, because we're playing a West Marches game, and we've got different players coming in at different places, I'm basically just giving out one point per session. Yeah. But I could do that differently. If I was playing in a campaign, then I could give out one point to all the players at the moment where they discover the mouth of the tomb of X, and another point at the point where they discover that you know, the person they've all been after the whole time is actually just the henchman of somebody else. And they need to go to another another area. Um, but so I think of experiences as just like the currency of experience. But I think I'm at the moment, I'm thinking it as just milestone level. You know, you you play the session, Excellent. you get one. Yeah. But Sorry, you Colin, could, I let you carry on. But yeah. you could tie it in to other stuff. You could tie yeah. it into the, per, the, the, the actual character's goals you could do something like that so yeah like the, keys the, like a quest yeah. like a quest mm -hmm. type of idea so there's there's things like that and what you do is um you then you so you share it with the group so it, it doesn't specify how you do that so do you sit down and you, you just chat about it or we've been putting it on discord you could just put it on your google docs however you want to share it Few few paragraphs or just one paragraph, whatever. If, if it was round the table, if it was round the table, this yeah, would be your campfire moment, wouldn't you? You'd yeah, be talking. Campfire. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your campfire moment, as Dave says. And w the the other interesting thing is, and I think this is more what you was perhaps getting at, John, is is it does it need to relate to the mm. activity you've just engaged in? Yeah. And mm. it, and it's 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 not set in stone that yeah. when you read it, it actually sounds like you're talking about something that happened. You just talk about something in from your from your mm -hmm. from your past. So it's another way of bringing out your mm. background. Yeah. So you could so you and there's a couple of ways you can interpret that. So did something happen like a triggering thing that then causes a flashback? Yeah. Or or do you just tell a story? that it is a way of kind of summarizing a session so it's really current it's just it's bloody it's bloody clever and then yeah. carousing is the way that the cost is applied to it so for one experience point you've got a you've got a um, go carousing for each experience point you roll a d6 that d6 is an amount of coins that it costs you and is the result on a carousing table. So you can wind up in trouble if you roll like low. So a low roll, something dodgy or not so good, but is cheap. Mm. And then I was going to say, or, or, or if you're a legend, so the, I say if you're a legend like Drenge, you can be like, boom, extra charisma points. So the, yeah, but the, the, yeah. the point is that you're not optionally carousing to burn off no. some gold to get XP, right? Yeah, the carousing... That whole process that Colin's talked about, which I, yeah, I agree, is it's character development. You're unlocking mm. something maybe out of your past or you're reflecting on the past session. It doesn't really matter, but it's character development and it costs some money because you've got to buy everyone drinks as you're telling the story. So it's locked together. It's not optional yeah. carousing. And it's no. also, it's not one of those carousing things that people sometimes complain about, like you've got to spend money and then you get lumbered with, you know, some event that happens to you because, you know, you got drunk and you found yourself in some other kingdom or something like that. Um, but it does have those options, doesn't it? It has the yeah, options. It does. You can that, get in a fight. Yeah. And I was in a fight yeah. previously. <laughs> and then we, it, it meant I had reduced hit points and it didn't matter because we never got into combat. So I, I, yeah. I got away with it. So that was good. Yeah, I mean, we're talking but that, about that, that's um, carousing. I was going to say we're talking about uh, in terms of like the rules being condensed down. Pretty much ninety nine percent of the rules are in like the first thirty pages. Yeah. yeah, of the book, and that includes character sheets and stuff like that. And that's the the players section. So if you're a player, that's all you need to look at. Then beyond that, in the GM section, there's not a great deal of rules. Most of it is like generators and charts. And stuff to sort of like help the GM and spur their ideas on for for running games, you know, like generating settlements, dungeons, stuff like I, that. Yeah, I think this is definitely a game for GMs because you know you've got the player facing roles, so the yeah. GM 
be left alone to to, to craft the uh, the adventure, uh, and the players are doing all the heavy lifting dice wise, aren't they, Dave? Yeah, well, yeah, dice wise definitely, but also story wise. I mean, every everything mm. that Colin just alluded to, like all of those possibilities, in the book, that is one page yeah. of not very dense text of digest size book right and it's you know and part of that page is the random table for what happens as you're carousing so all of that kind of deep character development that colin was talking about all those possibilities are just on one page of this digest size book and that's that's brilliant like a really rules light system that has these surprisingly powerful um mechanisms um, yeah, yeah, but absolutely, as you say, the only time I, as a GM, roll dice actually is because I'm mucking about with a random table. I mean, um, even if I, you look at I, the... I don't, yeah, I don't do any secret dice. There's no, there's no, there's none um, of that. Uh, Everything is player facing. You if, roll. If, if, if you look at yeah. monsters, um, monsters cause set damage. So you don't, the GM doesn't even have to roll for the damage. It's just. Each monster is allocated how much damage they cause. Yeah, that's optional. I mean, they do, they could roll dice, but I don't see why. It's just a standard average that I that I use. Yeah. I mean, it's nice of the uh, the philosophy of like sort of simplified rules that the pack a punch sort of carries on throughout the entire book. I mean, if you mm. look at like the monster stats yeah. at the end, so looking at one of my favourites, the telepathic gastropoid, which is effectively a mind flayer in a spacesuit, judging by the uh, the uh, picture. It gives you a little bit of a description. It tells you things you might find on them, and that's just like a little paragraph, like a little equipment list. It gives you some stats. So you've got stats for lobotomized slaves, so they're, they're mind adult slaves, and then the cephalopod wizard themselves. Then you just get, and they're very little stat blocks. You just get like their strength scores, uh, how much damage they inflict, maybe one or two special rules. So the the lobotomized slaves they they never make morale checks because they're, yeah. they're mind wiped the um never never more than two special rules never yeah. in the whole book yeah the the cephalopod wizard has like a couple of special attacks which are like mind blasts and stuff like that um which are basically spells and that's pretty much it um Ooh. the only other things on there are you get two tables both d6 one which says they are which tells you like what they might be doing when you encounter them and then it says with so i'm just gonna i'll do another day there and grab a d6 so i've rolled twice and what so when i encounter this telepathic gastropoid it is phasing into the void by mirroring its image so it's like duplicating itself as part of like some sort of teleportation right. process or something like that and that, that, I would say, is classic. That's what I would call, Pete talked about it earlier. Well, it would be a previous episode now, but he called it Indie OSR. That's what I would call Indie OSR. Because if you go back to OSR books, right, you get you actually get paragraphs and paragraphs of description about the monster and what they might do and what they might be up to and things like that. Whereas in this book, you get that table. There aren't those great chunks of descriptive text telling you about the monster what it might be doing you just get that table you know roll there it's doing this to this um and i think that's brilliant it's it was a, a masterpiece of concision um but mm. it that is generative of all kinds of different situations in which you could encounter the monster um actually other games do something similar icrpg gives you the um gives you a kind of reaction table doesn't it it tells you it, it gives you a table yeah. that you can roll on for, for what the monster's up to when you encounter it um but I, that that to me is modern osr design you know not not mucking about with loads of descriptions of the creature's ecology um or the or the various tactic tactics it might employ just a, two tables um and, and the other thing which, lots um... of possible variation and yeah. the other thing which John tapped onto then was uh, the spells. I mean, mm -hmm. the spells, you've got 40 spells for magicians, 40 spells for um, the clerics, and each uh, of those 40 spells is on one page. It's one line, yeah. Yeah. Four, four spells per level, and yeah. it's nice and simple, not two or three paragraphs. It's This is what it does. 
and then yeah. it leaves it to the players if they want to embellish it they can do yeah i i i think um it's that concise thing that that's mm. a real winner i was just thinking talking about those monsters the closest you'd get to that perhaps with osr would be the standard reaction table uh which i think i'm right in saying that went away in uh, I think that, I don't even know if that was in second edition AD and D. I don't think there was reactions and stuff like that in third edition and three five. Wasn't in third edition. No, you're right. It was not. Yeah, and, yeah. So this is like a returning, a return almost, but with a new spin on it. Yeah. So, yeah. Because so what did they do in the later editions? Monsters always attacked them, because BX it was always the as the GM you you rolled on the reaction table to see what the monsters did. Which is why well, I mean, I in, under, in third I edition, under, it was left up to you, wasn't it? Yeah, it was I down mean, to the GM. There was no decision. assumption that they would necessarily attack, but there wasn't the reaction tag. Yeah. So, you know, that was something that would contribute surely then to a little bit of... Um, if, if, if you don't use the reaction rolls and that, that's how Charisma ends up as a dump stat. Because... Hmm. I, I, see, I never understood why charisma. If you look at the rules, why is why do people call charisma a dump stat? Because that, if you've got bad charisma, that stitches you up for your henchmen. It stitches you up for reaction rolls, meeting NPCs and monsters. So, hmm. I, I was listening to someone's yeah. podcast. I was listening to someone's podcast the other day, and they were using the reaction rolls for players selling their loot. And uh, when you go yeah. into the uh, well, yeah, the that's an NPC. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go in, go into the shop to sell your loot, and if you you're rolling low, you, you're getting sort of like twenty percent of what it's worth. If you get rolling high, you're getting ninety, ninety five percent. I thought, yeah, that's, yeah. that's what we well, a black, black, which is also black locked hack, into it? the black hack. Yeah, black hack. yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. you you negotiate for price, you and you you yeah. check mm. on your charisma. Mm. And we yeah. did used to roll under like that in D and D as well. So. When you was outside of the combat system and you was outside of the systems for the saving throws, it's like, oh, well, make a dex check. And that was always a roll under thing. Yeah. Yeah. But I, so, I, I mean, think, that, and that's... I think some people forgot forgot about that, didn't they, from the, yeah. from the old system? Yeah. They got lost. Was that when that, because they brought in skill systems and stuff that covered all that, didn't yeah. they, in later editions? I think one of the other things that's uh, very worthwhile about the, the Black Hack is. Even if you're even if you're not going to run it, as we've said earlier on, there's a lot of generators in it and sort of charts mm. that are very useful. I know Dave, you did a, I think you gened up a, a settlement, was it, recently using I, it? I did, yeah. I did a I did a village. I mean, I must I must admit that I, having embraced the idea of using the generators, what I'm primarily using for my campaign is not the generators from the Black Hack book. But I think they are beautiful things. Yeah, I mean, it's, de it's definitely a thing where, even though I'm running castles and crusades for my like regular game, if the player characters are like, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna travel to a small village or whatever," I would probably reach for the black hat because I know I can just use the drop yeah. charts in there and just be like, "Boom, there's there's a village, crack on with the game. It's nice and simple," and uh, but you still get like a quite a sort of characterful result big from the tables in there yeah so i think even if you're not yeah. planning on running the black hack full bore as it is there's still a lot that's very useful in the book so, yeah. so, Spen so spencer we talked about it so like from a gm's perspective as a, a person who's a player how do you find the black hack um yeah well what was what was going through my mind there exactly the same sort of point from the player's perspective i will when I created my character, Brad, I ended up with a book of grudges, which is essentially yeah. a, a, a means of creating my own uh, rumours. And so um, and Dave persuaded me to create a, a random table for every time I looked in my book of grudges, which was um, a <laughs> fantastic idea. And then, and then when I levelled up, I, uh, I rolled a six while carousing, which meant that I could create a whole additional element to my background, uh, which meant I can now invoke two different things uh, that would give me advantage. I thought, well, that's how I interpreted it. I yeah, that's how that. I interpret it as yeah. well. Yeah. 
but um, yeah, yeah, and I just ended up. Um, it just it just feels like I'm in a fleshed out world with fleshed out characters, and it's um, and it's all comes from these very simple, you know, sometimes just one line ideas, you know. I think as well um, the one of the handy things about it is I think it's probably particularly good for for online play as well mm. because obviously when you're when you're playing online. There's the whole technological aspect that you have to come to grips with, so it's nice if the if the rules present as little further impediment to you getting involved in the game. And yeah. I think Black Hack sort of expertly treads that line between it's simple, but there's still a, a lot of sort of stuff and like little bits and pieces that make your character quite interesting and that give you inspiration. Mm -hmm. But it never sort of strays over into. In order to do this, we're going to have to give you like shed loads of rules. Because, as Dave said, all the rules for your character are on like two digest size pieces yeah. of paper, and that includes your character sheet. And I will say, like com combat is pacey. Combat that you know, you you can get a combat done with, and then get on to the next thing. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty quick to get through those things i i find that as you say the combat's quick and i think the rules encourage role playing as opposed to rolling dice yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I think one of the um one of the nice things as well is we talked about monsters a bit earlier on it, in a lot of, sort of more complicated systems if they don't provide guidelines for creating monsters i know personally I'll often look at it and I'll be like, all right, well, I'm going to have to just adapt a monster I've got or because I'm not really sure how I'd go about making one from scratch. Whereas looking at the sort of abbreviated stat blocks and just like one or two special abilities, I would feel quite comfortable in making a creature in Black Hack wholesale and I'd be yeah. reasonably confident that it'd be sort of about the power level I'd want because it's not complicated. Yeah. yeah. Well, you just basically pick a hit dice. Give it a it's hit easy. die and then it's give it one one ability. Yeah, yeah, you're done. Yeah, and it's the any monster. Is it called any monster? Yeah, every a, monster. A mon every yeah. monster. There's a yeah. monster called every monster, yeah. which is your yeah. your template. Uh, and yeah, that, gives that, you a cool. few special well. abilities to pick from, and you, yeah, you're yeah. done. You yeah. see, I, I like the fact that that's even though it is idea. it is extremely simple to just create a monster from scratch, they they've still gone the extra step of adding that sort of template creature in to make yeah. it even easier but all of yeah but all of that yeah. but all of that the the rules lie the milestone experience um you know all of that i would say so far has just facilitated it's just got out of the way and mm. just let the players just you know riff off the environment and do whatever they like really um, I, t I tell you what um black i could be good for running a game of you know Fighting fantasy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would work very well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It just really sings. I think it really sings. I, th I think this is this game really got played in the development. I know it's a second edition. Yeah. But there's some games gone into getting these rules together. It's. You know? uh... What is strange? I think the armor rules came late, but yeah. apart from that, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was an awful lot of hype when the first edition came out, but there doesn't seem to be much hype on the second edition, does there? What, what, one thing I have noticed that we've not mentioned is the uh, in the first edition there was a lot of additional sort of like hacks bought out, sort of adapted Loads, black hack yeah. for like hundreds. I mean, if you go on, if you just type black hack hacks into Google. There's hundreds of yeah. race hacks, class hacks, whatever you want to call Cthulhu it. Cthulhu hack. Yeah, yeah. Cthulhu Drag hack, hack, different genres, loads of different ones. Mm. I, I don't seem to have seen anywhere near as many for second edition. Oh. Well, you don't need them because they're, yeah. it's not changed enough for you to re-hack it. I think all them old hacks are still valid. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the changes, I know the changes pretty well. I mean, certainly armor rules, that's going to make no difference to a Cthulhu hack. Or um, the jack hack, there's no armor yeah, in it, so yeah. there you go. Some of the other things were like, I mean, they're pretty, they're pretty small. I mean, 
so so wizards get a bit nerfed in second edition wizards had a had a bonus to resist magical effects much like the thief's dexterity bonus that is still got in oh, second edition and they don't have that. that anymore um you know but that those those are really sort of fantasy specific differences mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. if you were already happy that your classes were balanced or whatever equivalent you had then you wouldn't really need to engage with the second edition and certainly most of second edition is all those tables which again mm-hmm. are specific to a particular kind of genre a particular kind of flavor mm-hmm. um so yeah so you wouldn't need it really you wouldn't need to update cthulhu hack or all or, or the various other hacks I was just going to say I've backed um, Barbarians of the Ruined Earth, which is Mike right. Evans, is it? He's um, he's uh, Thunder, the Barbarian, oh, basically. Yeah. Hack. And uh, that's just advertisers, a, a hack of the black hack. You know, there's no mention of uh, 2E there. And um, I, I don't think it would probably make sense to refer to 2e in that sense really there's nothing to it apart from that it's a roll Mm. under system i mean there really is nothing else and the usage die there's 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 nothing else Mm. um tell you what you you best believe i've just bought a copy of the jack hack on a drive-through rpg right (laughs) on the spot yeah (laughs) i I fancy some of that victorian london like black hack action Mm. Yeah, it's quite interesting. It's got it's added in. If we're going to talk brief, uh, do we want to talk briefly about hacks? We're kind of going that way. Go yeah. for yeah. it. Yeah. So it's got a a black and a white dice that's added in, and the black dice is like your inner strength kind of thing, uh, almost like it could be interpreted as sanity or your spirit or something. And then the white hack, uh, the white dice is your like social uh, your yeah, contacts like your, your social system, standing mm. yeah yeah uh, within Whitechapel it's set in Whitechapel uh, if you take it you know rules is written nice and that uh, I think I think that's a way I think that's almost a bit of a replacement for armor so that you can you can kind of make some you can make some attacks on people in a kind of a um, a less physical way so you mm-hmm. you can attack their white white dice being resources and you know the black and white dice are basically resources that you can attack other than their hit points kind of thing um so i think i think that might be why why that's used i haven't played it yet but it's got some good stuff in there like um random tables for uh near the wells they're like one line entries of kind of local criminals. Mm-hmm. There's quite a few Victorian things uh, like slang, uh, f- food and drink and stuff like that, like flavor type stuff. And then there's quite fleshed out NPCs with their, I forget how many of them there are with their, like what they're up to their fronts kind of thing. Uh, a, a quick description and what they're trying to achieve and why and why they're bad sort of uh, it gives you ideas for like adventure seeds stuff like that it, it explains briefly well what a character's doing in the jack hack um and it yeah it's a pretty decent hack the layout yeah it, it's a bit of a sort of a looks a bit like a word document that's been bumped up on yeah yeah, it's quite basic, and some of the tables, it, you know, it just goes. It just, it it'd have been all right if it was all rolled on a scroll. Do you know what I mean? Because it mm. it splits tables a bit uncomfortably. Mm. Um, yeah, could have done with a bit of polish, but it, it's 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 buttons. It costs you buttons on drive through. Um, Oh, if I was putting it out, I'd have had to mess about with that for ages and make that a little bit slicker. The resolution's not great on it; you can't enlarge it much. But that's mm. oh, that's you know picky, picky spike pit. Yeah. <clears throat> Drink. That's me criticising layout. Drink. 
Uh, yeah, another one I like is the Cthulhu hack. I thought they did quite a good yeah. job with that. Um, Paul Badowski. Yeah, he, he brought in flashlights and smokes as a mechanic, which I thought fitted in really well with the. Yep, yeah. another one. Yeah, John's showing his uh, copy to the camera. Yes, I've got a copy as well. I think we probably, probably we all have. Yeah, but you you spend your smokes to get yeah. your info and stuff That's like right. that. Then yeah. it's a really nice mechanic. And, fla and yeah. flashlights. I think flashlights yeah. was for investigation, and smokes was for yeah. getting from uh, getting from people. So yeah, that was a clever mechanic. Um, Second edition of that coming soon. Was oh, it twenty? I think. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Oh, excellent. Um, another hack I enjoy was Stay Frosty, which was uh, aliens done in uh, mm. space. That's uh, that's a, a good one. I've played that one. Did you play that, Spencer? Did you play Stay Frosty? Was you in that game? No, no. I played the um, the IC RPG one. Ah, really, um... uh, that's what I'd be thinking of then. Zeno yeah. no Dead Zone. Yeah. Mm. There's the mech hack. You can yeah. find. Yeah, the mech hack. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think Arlen's talked about the mech hack. He certainly called into me about the mech hack. Isn't that's... that the? Is that the one that um, Runehammer did the art for? Brandish Gilhelm. I think it was the mecha hack. What, for the mech hack? Oh, the mech, the mecha hack, I think so. Yeah. He did, I know he did it for one of them. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, you're right. Was. It's the mecha hack. I'm saying mech hack. It's the mecha yeah, hack. hack. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eric Sawsweedle's uh, on the Discord often talking about that. I think he likes that hack. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, there are, some, there are some good ones out there. Yeah. What's the other one? The front. The World War Two. I like the look at that one. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I haven't yeah. seen that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I'll tell you who talks about that. Larry Hamilton, follow okay. me and die. Right. He uh, talked about that. He did an episode because I called into him and I knew he was involved in it in some way. I think he okay. proofread or play tested on it. And right. He runs it at cons and he he recommended it as a World War Two game somewhere along the line. And I thought, oh yeah, I like the Black Hack. I'll check yeah. it out. And I was not disappointed. And it's actually that that's quite nice. It uses uh steels from World War Two and it's oh, yeah. for, for for a little game on drive through, I think that's simple but quite nicely done that one. Right. I was gonna say I think one of the things about the, the black hack and I know we were talking about this when we, we talked about old school essentials in the um, sort of Christmas wish list episode where we're saying we expected we'd be seeing a lot more sort of like hacks and sort of genre rules and stuff to go with that because the system's quite easy to adapt. I think obviously the same has been the case and probably will be the case in the future for the black hack because it's such a simple and versatile system. It's probably not difficult to adapt it to different genres as we've seen with previous hacks you can you can tweak it some of them have like little subsystems like riffing off like the usage dice and stuff like that like the smokes and the flashlights and cthulhu hack so i'd be surprised if once people have sort of got more of a handle on like whatever ch small changes have been between first edition and second edition mm. we don't start seeing more hacks coming out for the black hack i yeah. think perhaps 5e's had a bit of an impact on on it the, the growth in popularity i noticed a few of the people that were doing stuff for other systems a lot of people are going oh no i'm gonna do my stuff for 5e now and there's a guy i've got in my mind who does the monster books i keep wanting